Good morning, everybody uh, in Europe. Good afternoon, those of you here in Southeast Asia. My name is Chris Humphrey. I'm the Executive Director at the EU ASEAN Business Council. Welcome to this, our latest webinar, looking at uh, broader sustainability issues here in Southeast Asia. Today, looking at legislating on extended producer responsibilities in ASEAN. Is there a need? Um, I think we all know that plastic pollution indeed has become a major problem in Southeast Asia. In 2021, more than 30 million tonnes of plastic waste were generated by just six of the ASEAN member states, packing landfills and choking water bodies throughout the region. It is clear now that there is more urgent action needed to tackle the issue, and one way for doing so is to remove on extended producer responsibility. Collecting, sorting and recycling of post-consumer products costs governments money. To ensure that such efforts can be meaningfully scaled and continue to be funded, EPR schemes can be implemented. EPR is a policy approach that shifts the responsibility of waste management, financial or physical, away from local authorities and to producers. The advantages of such schemes are obvious, and yet implementation remains sparse across Southeast Asia. On a regional level, the ASEAN Secretariat has plans to develop a regional guidebook on financial mechanisms for investments in plastic waste management, a handbook on EPR and a knowledge sharing platform as part of its efforts to combat marine waste. However, many of these sound like voluntary commitments from member states rather than real legislation. Today, I hope we will discuss how stakeholders on both the public and private sectors can encourage and accelerate the adoption of EPR in ASEAN, the challenges in doing so, particularly for MSMEs and the private sectors, and how we can get a buy-in from all stakeholders along the chain, from manufacturers to governments, to waste facilities and ultimately to consumers. I am joined here today by a, a very good panel. You can see them all on your screens now. We have Henriette Fergman, who is the first councillor for Environment, Climate Action and ICT at the EU delegation to Indonesia. We have Sunita Kapoor, who is the head of Government Affairs and Sustainability for Southeast Asia for RECET. Uh, Tommy Tiptajaya, who is the CEO of Green Hope. Green Hope is a green tech firm looking at sustainable production and consumption. And we have Colin Go from the Singapore National Environment Agency. And last but not least, Shin Chen, who is the global EPR project manager for the WWF. Greetings to all of you. I hope you're all well. I hope we can have a nice and stimulating uh, conversation this afternoon. Uh, Henriette, I'll actually come to you, if you don't mind, for the first question. The EU has done an awful lot of work already in terms of EPR schemes and waste management through its Waste Framework Directive. Perhaps you can just give us a quick overview of what the EU has done and the benefits that have been seen within the European Union and perhaps some views about how ASEAN could look to the EU for some guidance. Yeah, thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning to everybody in, in Europe. I hope you can hear me well. Um, yeah, so indeed, uh, extended producer responsibility is one of the tools that the European Union has been developing now for quite some time. And uh, just to start a bit with, uh, you know, what are the advantages of this? Uh, it's really our experience that, that it does give a lot of advantages, both in terms of, of course, protecting the environment, but also both economic and social uh, advantages. Some of the advantages are that it leads definitely to a higher separate collection and recycling rates for, for example, for plastic waste. That now you mentioned plastic, which is, of course, very high on everybody's agenda. It also contributes to uh, and motivates really producers to, to have a much more friendly, environmentally friendly packaging design. It reduces overpackaging and it therefore automatically decreases pollution uh, and, for example, plastic leakage into rivers and oceans. And also, we have seen that it increases resource efficiency uh, and it, of course, preserves uh, virgin materials as more and more uh, things are recycled. Extended producer responsibility is a bit of a complex um, concept, but also uh, one of the things that we have seen and that I think will also speak very nicely to, uh, to the ASEAN concept is that it's very flexible, so it can really be adapted very well to, uh, to everybody's needs. One of the key challenges that we have seen uh, in the EU has been to really clearly define what are the, uh, what are the obligations and, and what are the responsibilities for, for each of the different parts of, of the whole value chain. So, uh, of course, the objective is to create a level playing field to make sure that importers and brand owners uh, uh, can, can, play, uh, can, can play in the same way in the market, uh, I would say. 
and also to rule out that uh, that so-called uh, what we call free riders uh, can take advantage of the system so meaning that they benefit from the system but they don't pay for it uh, which of course we want to avoid and actually these free riders um, has been one of, of the key challenges that we have seen while we've implemented this epr in in europe there are also other challenges that I just wanted to to bring out now. It sounds maybe all uh, very challenging, but uh, but I think it's good to get this on the on the table already now. A challenge is, has also been for us to to build and operate a collection and treatment infrastructure, and and I suppose that that could also be uh, a, a challenge here in in ASEAN, uh, given the the vastness of the region uh, and so on. And also, we have seen that the stability of um, of prices uh, has been a little bit difficult to ensure um, and, and that means that of course there needs to be certain predictability uh, in order to make sure that, that uh, the different uh, operators really commit uh, to this. Among the benefits, uh, just very briefly, I know you want to ask uh, questions to other people also, um, the benefits that I think are relevant to, uh, to ASEAN countries is that these systems do uh, attract investments in the recycling and uh, waste management industries, which can otherwise be difficult to obtain. It has a very good job cre creation potential uh, and, and it creates high quality employment uh, in terms of both uh, income qualifications and, and working condition. And of course, as I mentioned before, um, it reduces the um, the uh, dependency on uh, virgin materials, it, uh, it's helpful for tourism industry, uh, as we will have less uh, materials lying around on the beaches. Um, so coming to the role of ASEAN, we really believe that it could be extremely beneficial uh, for ASEAN to have a, a kind of a regional framework uh, with, uh, with harmonized uh, rules and at least sharing practices uh, among the region. And, and I think that uh, the EU has a lot of experience that we could share. Um, so all in all, uh, it's really about a transition, transition towards a circular economy, moving away from linear thinking and linear economic models um, and so on. And, and all of this, of course, very importantly to, to really uh, see in the context also of the growing, um, the growing populations here and the growing consumptions in, in the region. So, uh, yeah. All of that is why I think it's great that you've put this on the agenda for today. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Colin, I'll, I'll come to you. Um, you know, you're the chief engineer at the Produce Responsibility Department at Singapore's National Environment Agency. I think Singapore is probably a bit more forward in its thinking in this area than many of your neighbours nearby. Perhaps you can just give us uh, an overview of what's your experience been on, on working on EPR legislation. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Chris and um, the EU ASEAN Business Council for organizing this and very good afternoon for, to our friends and colleagues in Asia and good morning to the rest uh, of our friends in the, in the EU. So um, I think I'll share a little bit more about our experience in uh, implementing the EPR scheme in Singapore. Um, the most important aspect, I think, is to consult uh, our industry stakeholders early, meaning the producers, uh, the retailers, the PROs, uh, as well as the recyclers. So actually, um, Singapore just implemented the scheme uh, on 1st July last year, 2021. But we actually commenced consultations uh, in 2015 when we announced to uh, uh, the general public that there would be a national regulated e-waste measurement system. So I think signaling to the industry early enabled us to uh, obtain the feedback uh, from the industry, as well as to develop a, a scheme that was really customized uh, for Singapore's context. So as, as most EPR schemes uh, you know, were implemented, there, there would definitely be some pushback from the industry. So um, I mean, we, we had to um, uh, maintain uh, you know, that uh, the principle of an EPR scheme, which is producer responsibility, right? But at the same time, taking into consideration you know, the administrative and cost burden that will be imposed uh, on the industry. Uh, so during the consultation, um, we took into account uh, several unique features for our uh, Singapore scheme. Uh, one of which is a collected treated model. So I think in most uh, other EPR schemes, um, producers pay fees uh, on the amount of uh, electrical and electronic products that they supply to the market. In Singapore, it's a little bit different. They pay fees mainly based on the amount of e-waste that has been collected by the PRO. So it's a collected treated model rather than an upfront model. Um, we also implemented quarterly billing by the producers to alleviate you know, high payments if, if you were to do it uh, on a yearly basis. Um, our EPR scheme also started with uh, slightly low, lower collection targets 
uh, for the first five years. Uh, you know, it's more to ease the industry into the scheme. And as well as uh, our collection targets are actually imposed on the PRO rather than on the producers. Uh, and, and because of that, we also had to make sure that the scheme uh, was uh, implemented well. And we said that there was no penalties imposed on this operator, the PRO, uh, for the first three years, more to help him uh, lay the ground and you know build up its uh, operational infrastructure and collection uh, infrastructure. So uh, another thing is that uh, as part of the requirements, all the producers had to uh, declare the amount of uh, electrical and electronic equipment uh, supplied to the Singapore market to the NEA. So what happens, the NEA will uh, check the data, uh, compute the data to determine the market shares, which would in turn then uh, uh, determine the, the amount of EPR fees that they pay. So where it's on a collected, treated model based on e-waste collected, there's also a component of uh, market share of the respective uh, producers to apportion the fees accordingly. Um, and, and so through this uh, reporting regime, it, it was important for any to actually verify that the data was, uh, has been submitted uh, to the NA was accurate and you know, free of error. So we had to develop our own verification framework where our own uh, NA officers had to go down and audit the data uh, from these producers. And, and that's mainly to ensure that the integrity of the EPR scheme was uh, maintained, yeah. So far, so good. Yep. So we need to, uh, yeah, so, so, uh, you know, from a large MNC operating, I mean, perhaps you can just give us your viewpoint uh, on EPR. I mean, it, it does shift the responsibility towards the manufacturers of, of goods, particularly cons consumer goods. And there have been a number of challenges for companies like yourselves in implementing EPR schemes. So perhaps you can just walk us through how Ricket is seeing it and, and how you're gonna deal with some of those challenges. Yeah, thanks, thanks Chris. And good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Um, so uh, Chris, I, I see three key implementation challenges uh, for companies such as Racket and other players in the supply chain. And I can give these three challenges, three different uh, buckets. Firstly, partnership. Second, complexity around plastic sourcing. And the third challenge is around protecting human rights. So firstly, on, on partnerships, um, Racket, uh, for those who might not know, is a hygiene, nutrition, and health expert. Uh, you may know us better by some of our brands, such as Dettol, Lysol, Durex, uh, Strapsils. And we are immensely pa passionate about sustainability. Uh, we are working very hard to enable a circular economy. We are ensuring our operations are water, po water positive in water, stress sites. We are ensuring fairness across the uh, value chain. But uh, to put it candidly, we are not waste management specialists, right? Uh, this is why a plastic waste uh, collection ecosystem is incredibly important, but that's where the challenge lies for companies such as Racket. Uh, this ecosystem is still very much in a developing stage for ASEAN, and while we are rising up to the challenge to reduce plastic waste and, and, and you know, protect our environmental future, we need to invest in the collection and recycling infrastructure. And a key challenge for many companies is identifying these partners, and this is something that we cannot work in isolation, um, and it needs to be worked at the societal level with a broader group of stakeholders. So what will really help expedite the process is if governments can identify or develop more licensed accredited vendors who can help with organizing collection and recycling. Uh, we can then contract with that company on collection and sorting directly. So for example, Racket produces, uh, let's say 10 kilos of waste in a site in a specific ASEAN member state. We pay a corresponding amount to this vendor at a collection and sorting rate per, per, ki per kilo. Uh, actually, we are already uh, sorting waste at our sites and trying to recycle already. For example, how we dispose of uh, waste latex for our Durex condoms at our one of our sites in Thailand, which is then used to make sandals locally. And in other cases, we're sending plastic waste for recycling, but we need more scale infrastructure for these in the wider uh, marketplace. So overall, a government-led collaborative system can help with economies of scale and help recyclable plastics to be sorted and brought back into the economy instead of uh, ending up in the landfills. 
I'll move on to the second challenge, which is the complexity around plastic softing. And the reason why waste collection, softing and treating around plastics is such a momentous task, not only because of the amount of plastic waste in ASEAN and around the world, and Chris, you mentioned a number just now, but it's primarily because plastic is very complicated. It's, uh, there's a number of different types, right? Some are reusable, others less so, and if they're not disposed of uh, carefully, they can lead to hazardous waste. Some are easily recyclable, uh, others need more sophisticated recycling processes. And um, honestly, there are seven typical plastics with too many acronyms for me to remember or mention here. But the two types of plastics that are mostly picked up by recycling product programs are PE and HDPE. So within this co context, how can the collectors, waste management companies identify the recyclable plastics to be collected, segregate them as required? And I think this is where technology may play a key role. Uh, sometime in 2020, Racket with a number of other industry players joined the Holy Grail project, which is developing an industry-wide digital watermark and tracing system uh, to improve the sorting and the recycling infrastructure. Um, from my understanding, how it works is that the packaging surface will have a digital watermark the size of a postage stamp. And the aim is that once the packaging has entered into a waste sorting facility, the digital watermark can be detected and decoded by a high resolution camera on the sorting line. And I believe this sort of optical sorting is already possible with colors of packaging and even types to a degree. But this sort of digital watermark can improve accuracy and so improves recycling because the end goal is we want to ensure there's better quality plastic that goes into recycling. And the better the systems for processing, the better the supply of materials such as PSR. And um, we have this at the UK level, but we have something like this in ASEAN. I've been looking around and I've, I'm, I'm certain uh, as to whether there's something like this. But um, we can also look to different types of recycling, not just sorting and regrinding PT for recycling, but others such as chemical and even bacterial recycling, which I won't touch on too much here because it gets very technical. Um, and finally, Chris, if I may just quickly touch upon challenge on human rights, right? Uh, this is something around protecting human rights. The people collecting waste for reuse, waste that therefore has value should see some of the value. That's our standpoint and position. Uh, this includes street pickers who are helping to complete the loop. They must be compensated family, uh, fairly, and they're usually considered the food soldiers and can come from the most vulnerable communities with high rates of, uh, of uh, poverty. So uh, we, let's treat the people involved as valuable uh, contributors. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop at there, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Nita. Uh, very valid point, your last one there. And the complexity of recycling plastic. Having spent a large part of my youth at uh, university working in a recycling plant, I, way ahead of its time many, many years ago, I certainly understand the complexities there. Uh, Pat, Tommy, uh, for Green Hope, you, you have a vision for a plastic free future. Um, and I guess that EPR will play a lot of a big role in that. Perhaps you can just give us your, your view about how to, we can achieve a plastic free future. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris, and thank you for the EU ASEAN Business Council for inviting us. And uh, good morning and good afternoon for everyone here too, and those who are watching. Um, really, Green Hope is a social enterprise through technologies, and my co-founder partner actually researched for 10 years and then went through so many failures in terms of his number one question is, what is the better behaving materials that can be very much part of the future of humankind? And the reason being that we come with that question is that there are two big intertwined environmental, massive environmental problems. One is climate, the other one is the plastic waste pollution. And they are intertwined and often if we wanna solve one, we should not make worse of the other ones. So that's how we start to think through the whole thing. And to do that, we realize that look, one is there is an opportunity for more renewable, more sustainable, better behaving materials, uh, but two, we also have to use this. I wouldn't say we will be 100% plastic free in the future, to be honest, Chris, because there will be parts of it that will be the best to use plastics, but there are definitely a role to use more renewable source plastic, and there's a role to use reuse and the others. So we need to have a more targeted segments. And three, we need to have a better system, and that system is the EPR, the social innovation, the behavior change. 
Now, if we zoom a little bit on the better behaving material, what do we mean by that in Green Hope when we see we've had many challenges and many failures in terms of finding the better materials of the future. But what we see is that at least any innovators needs to get three things right. And the first one is that the environmental value. We need to really understand what are the locally sourced, abundantly available, therefore scalable in the future. Uh, therefore less carbon footprint on transportations and logistics. And we also need to design the end of life, this material suitable to the environment, to the weather, to the end of life situation of that local area. Therefore, is it compostable? Is it in the landfill? Is it in the incinerators? We need to start also with the end in mind. So the environmental value goes from two sides. One is, does it consume less carbon? For instance, if we use some of the renewable source materials that we're looking at in ASEAN, uh, our uh, biomaterials can save 30% less carbon footprint compared to conventional plastics. So on the get-go, we help countries to decarbonize. And then the end of life should be better also in line with the end of life situation of that. Two is this is where a lot of challenges in the new materials. Functionally, it has to be effective. We can be very excited, yeah, water soluble, biodegradable material, but then it's not functional, it's not usable for packaging, for, for the records of the world and all that stuff. That is challenging. And third, this is the reality. And we hope the EPR legislation uh, can help change this, which is it, the economic challenge. It has to be economically affordable and scalable. Otherwise, we're going to be ramming against the invisible wall. So we need to get those three things right. Now, uh, let me dig a little bit here uh, more, which is even if you get the materials correct, it doesn't mean that we will realize the impact we're looking for. We need to understand that, that those materials can be meaningful in a, a newer, a better behaving systems. So this is where I learned a lot about this in terms of technology innovation alone is not enough unless you have a social innovation layer around it. So the social innovation layer is really the uh, inv uh, behavior change, the EPR, the waste management that needs to be improved, the economic that can be altered by legislation, by policy, for instance, that make the economic parity of the bio-based materials better convention compared to conventional plastic or oil-based, for instance, right? So all these uh, translate to, we really need to have, uh, I always often say this, I did not invent this, uh, quoting from my friend, uh, who says, less ego, more ego. We really know at the end of the day, the bio-based material, biodegradable, there's a space for certain items that are not economically viable to recycle. But then recycle is very good for PET bottles, for all the other items. But then if we can go up further, if we can do reuse, that's even go, uh, better, right? So the reduce, reuse, recycle, and to us, return to earth, those are all needs to be applied at different items, finished product under different contexts. Uh, or uh, uh, ASEAN context will be very different than Europe because the density of the population, 17,000 island, the GDP per capita, all those things will have economic impact of the solution, whether it's viable or not. Yeah, those are some of our learnings so far. And hopefully we're getting there. Uh, increasingly more people start congregating around the common shared understanding. Yeah. Well, people with passion like you, Pak Tommy, I think <laughs> in the region. Uh, Shin, let me uh, finally come to you for this first round of questions. You're covering uh, EPR issues globally for WWF. Let's just give us your overview of what some of the challenges are in rolling out EPR across the world and indeed particularly here in Southeast Asia. Thanks, Chris. Um, good day for everyone, wherever you are. So over the last three years, WWF have worked on EPR uh, under the no plus in Asia uh, initiative uh, in more than 10 countries, mainly in Asia and the Africa. So we cooperate with a wide range of the international and national organizations uh, to promote the, the EPR concept. And uh, WWF is one of the few NGOs have a dedicated resource work on EPR at such a broad scale. And in over the last three years, we have seen that the countries, particularly in Southeast Asia, have made significant progress in terms of EPR development. Some countries like Vienna and Singapore are quite advanced and have mandated the EPR implementation for managing the package waste. 
although the development of EPI in, uh, is more active than ever in these countries, there's still a long way to go and uh, much work needs to be done. There are quite a few uh, challenges for EPI adoption in this region, such as insufficient data, low capacity and understanding, and also the consumer behavior. But uh, I would like to highlight two challenges here, uh, which are quite common in this region. First is um, most of Southeast Asia countries lack collection, sorting, disposal, and the recycling facility in rural areas. This has led to high uh, level of mismanagement of plastic waste. For example, in Indonesia, 68% of the mismanagement of plastic waste comes from rural areas. The collection rate in rural areas is only 20% compared to 74% uh, in black cities. And the country like Philippines consists of more than 7,000 islands. Logistically, it's difficult to collect plastic waste from the far from areas, such islands and the mountains. So in addition, the cost of sending the recyclable waste to the recycling industry is also expensive. To tackle this challenge, it's required um, the central government to have a strategy to expand the service and to create a platform to have a dialogue between the local government and the PROs to explore a cost-effective way for the waste management collective uh, uh, collection service. And for example, a community-based collection um, service could be organized at uh, affordable price, which could also involve the existing networks of the informal sectors. To overcome the lack of the recycling capacity, it's recommended that the funding stream of the EPR system should be used for measures to improve the quality and the quantity of the recycled plastic in order to achieve the cross loop recycling. The other challenge is the existing market-based collection system of recyclables, which in most of the developing countries involve in the informal waste workers. Most of the EPI system have been implemented in advanced and the developed countries for decades and the real informal sector is not a major issue. So there are not many successful scale up or national level integration example for reference. However, the informal waste workers play a critical role in the waste management system is the backbone of the recycling sector. So if we don't consider the foundation of the informal sector, it will undermine the efficiency and the effectiveness of the EPR scheme. So currently, the contribution of the informal waste workers have gone largely unrecognized. Instead, they encounter many challenges in terms of social, economic, and the health. From the social impact, uh, impact perspective, it's also important to consider the formulation. To have a better integration, it's important to conduct a comprehensive research and the mapping process to identify all the actors, including the informal sector in the waste management system. And the government also need to recognize the role of the informal sector and the consultant with the informal waste workers and their organizations in the policy development process. At the operational level, we need to change the market-based buyback approach as it cannot be simply applied to low and non-value plastic package waste and is prone to littering. So labor-intensive collection and sorting this, uh, represent a great opportunity to integrate the informal waste pickers into the, the EPR system. And then the PRO can help by offering attractive and the formalized terms and conditions to encourage the waste pickers to apply for jobs. The employment contract can also be made directly between the employee and the PRO or between the employee and the company, which provide the service to the PRO. So the PRO should implement also uh, accessible and a fair, complete uh, procedure so that both formal and informal workers can raise concerns and report the abuse. WWE we have actually developed uh, 15 um, uh, basic principles for the establishing an effective EPR scheme for the package. And these um, principles serve as a benchmark for stakeholders to ensure that current EPR scheme development are on the right track. And it's a 
from four areas. So uh, the general consideration about EPR framework, I will not elaborate more, but I will highlight. So one, so, so from the EPR scheme, um, when the, the policy makers, when they design and uh, develop the EPR scheme, they need to consider that the, the design is to prioritize the actions according to the waste hierarchy and encouraging the efforts uh, towards a su sustainable circular economy. And also we mentioned about the scope, the financing and the controlling what kind of issues, elements you need to consider. and of course, the EPI should be uh, uh, provide an inclusive and enable the integration of all the stakeholders. And uh, you, um, uh, we have posted this in our website, so you can, uh, yeah, Google search may, uh, uh, you can see the whole yeah, document there. Yeah. So that is my input. Thank you. Thank you, Shin. So plenty of challenges out there for, for all of us, not least that you know different markets and different places are in different states and situations. Uh, Henriette, when you, when you were working, uh, when the EU was working on developing its, its waste uh, framework directive, you're also facing similar challenges. You know, everyone looks at Europe from this part of the world and thinks it's pretty harmonious, but the economy is there in very different states of development. And I can remember 20 years ago when I left Europe, some places were at very high rates of recycling manda mandated on households as well. What lessons there can be there for ASEAN if it really does want to go down the route of having an ASEAN framework? You know, what would be your advice about how to start approaching that? Yeah, well, first of all, um, I think, as I said before, it, it's very important to realize that there is no template that would really fit everybody. As you say, uh, it's it's not an entirely harmonious system, neither in ASEAN nor, nor in the EU. But what we typically do uh, in the EU is that we we have uh, an overarching piece of legislation that we call a directive uh, that sets out the general uh, targets that we would like our individual member states to achieve. But then we leave quite a lot of flexibility as to how they want to, uh, how, how they are going about um, achieving them. So, so I would not uh, say that we need to really identify a, a specific template. Uh, but, but of course, there are some, some obligations that we would like to, I mean, that are key to make this work. And I mean, from our experience, for example, uh, things as how are you going to finance the take back and recycling? Uh, uh, what kind of penalties are you going to put in there uh, in case of uh, non-achievement of the targets? Um, how are you going to, I mean, the whole administration around it, how are you going to register? How are you going to report? How are you going to make sure that everything is, is, is checked? And also, how are you going to make the public uh, engaged and involved in this? Because, I mean, of course, ultimately, it comes really much, very much down to the what the consumers uh, are, are willing to do. So they need to understand why they are doing this and, and how they can do it. And then just, uh, I think what is important is that, I mean, as we have already heard in this uh, few minutes that we've been together today, this region is really not starting from scratch. I mean, there's a lot of initiatives ongoing already. There are, I mean, some of the countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, as we heard, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, they are already uh, in process of promoting EPR uh, at national level or at local level, uh, for example, by updating their legislation or by developing standards or, or certain voluntary approaches uh, that the private sector is leading. So, so I think it's very important to bring all these together, look at them and, and see, you know, how can we, how can we learn lessons? How can we take the best out of all these schemes and, and really uh, develop it in, in a much uh, wider context? From the EU side, uh, we have a project with the region uh, where three of the countries are involved that is called Rethinking Plastics, where we are both uh, building on these uh, more legislative initiatives, but also trying to really implement pilot activities uh, in the different cities, uh, seeing how can we actually make this work uh, in, in, in real life here. So I think that is something uh, that's something that that I mean I would like to also bring to the table now that we have to to work both from the top uh, down with legislation uh, and and these kind of uh, tools, but also we need to to really try to see uh, how can we how could we find good ideas and how can we share these practices and, and implement them uh, across the region. Thank you, uh, Colin. Would would you agree with that assessment from a Singapore point of view? Uh yeah, I think so. I mean, all these um, policies and requirements have to be in place, uh, you know, before we roll out um, uh, these EPR schemes. Um, and I think the governments have to, um, at least in, in, in the ASEAN region, where I guess 
sustainability is less entrenched than say in the EU and the US, for example. We really have to guide and handhold uh, companies uh, during the initial phase. So what, what happened in Singapore was uh, uh, we, cons we consulted the industry and they were actually not ready to actually come together to form this PRO, the entity, right? So the government had to come in, had to come in and uh, you know, appoint a PRO through a public tender. And of course, awarded a license uh, for the PRO to operate uh, collection and recycling services in Singapore. Um, so that, that's a way, that's how we you know, uh, tried to guide and facilitate and, and you know, make sure that the EPR scheme uh, was, uh, uh, was implemented at, uh, when, at, at the beginning. And uh, I think there are some considerations that we have to take. Like for example, do you want the PRO to be on a not-for-profit or even for a for-profit uh, basis, right? So there, there are pros and cons, I think. Uh, I, I won't go into detail, but... Um, and if we appoint, as how Singapore has done through a license, um, the regulator will have to closely monitor and regulate the operations of the PRS operators. So that's one way that uh, you know, countries can, can consider approaching. But of course, then a lot of the responsibility lies with the regulator to ensure that it meets certain collection targets, that the service uh, standards for collection, even uh, recycling standards by appointing uh, uh, suitable uh, recyclers. And also, of course, um, some targets to implement uh, outreach and engagement activities. So uh, this, these are the various ways that you know, Singapore have uh, helped to sort of jumpstart the EPR scheme in Singapore. Whilst I've still got you, Colin, um, and others, please chime in on this question. I mean, we talk about the responsibilities on producers here, and that comes down to design in part or types of materials you're using, uh, reporting, as you mentioned, for the for the Singapore scheme at the moment. What about the consumer end of this? And we, with EPR, you still need consumers to be buying into it and putting things into the right bins, or you're just creating more work. How can we collectively go about educating consumers? And perhaps Sunita, I want to talk about how we can make sure that suddenly costs don't rise off the market or the supermarket shelf. For all these sorts of issues yeah so chris maybe i can take that question um firstly i would say you know if asean is thinking of you know coming up with a region-wide framework that is definitely uh, something of uh something of benefit definitely a harmonized approach in the region will be helpful uh, because, you know, large companies such as Racket, we have 10 manufacturing sites in seven ASEAN member states. In regards to consumers, um, if ASEAN comes up with a framework, there must be a principle of guidance around partnering with large companies, trade associations, civil societies and NGOs on consumer education and awareness programs. So we need to influence consumer behavior to boost the recycling rates. Uh, if I can give you some numbers, I believe in the UK, for instance, only around 25% of household plastic goes to recycling. Uh, in the US, it's only around 9%. So there's definitely an opportunity here for ASEAN to, to show the way. And I do want to mention that as a consumer healthcare company, Racket, and I believe a lot of our other players in the industry, we have commitment to public education and consumer awareness campaigns. And we have been conducting these uh, public education consumer awareness campaigns uh, for more than 100 years in 60 countries. So some key messages can be around, you know, don't forget to separate your waste responsibly. Uh, don't mix the organics with non-organics. Do segregate glass from plastic and paper. And we'll definitely be increasing our communication with consumers on how to dispose our packaging, example, uh, through labeling score, for instance. Thank you. Tommy Chin, your views on how we can better educate consumers and perhaps also is there a bigger role for government to play in that education program, either through simple education or perhaps through mandating the separation of waste at the point of collection? Right, right. I think what we've seen is that one is education is absolutely necessary. So the customer, uh, consumer really know that if they maintain the, re the, the cleanliness of their place, not uh, separate the waste and everything, then the whole place will be better and the land value of their area will be better as well. And then we always advocate that the government apply a more firmer fines also for those who actually don't do. So it's like stick and carrot and some sort of social pressure as well. Uh, you know, with CCTV by the river banks and everything, it's, it's easy to, to basically catch uh, people who throw stuff to the river. Um, but 
But I also want to go a little bit deeper in terms of the nuances of the ASEAN economies, right? ASEAN economies is really still, by and large, not Singapore. <laughs> uh, I think Indonesia and the other still less than 10% of GDP per capita of, of Europe. There's a reasons why these consumers buy sachet, buy smaller packs and everything. That is the reality of the economy. They get weekly wages, they get daily wages, they share their flats with three other families. So they can't buy a, a bulk shampoo that they, 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 they have to carry around. It's almost paper use uh, habit that that is really the trick, tricky part, right? That's one, that's the re economic reality. So how do we deal with that? Two is when it delves deeper into plastic, unlike paper and steel, Plastic is also unique by the nature of it being a byproduct of oil and gas production then turned into, into plastic, the polymers. Then the feedstock is really economically viable, very cheap and very high functionality, right? The plastic is probably one of the very few places where the recycled resin can be priced higher, more expensive than, than a virgin re resin. Why? Because, because when you... So when plastic being the wonderful material as it is, when it becomes a packaging that can be very thin, very small, distributed effectively to 17,000 islands, that's a value proposition from life cycle analysis, less carbon. But the, from recycle analysis, that's flip it. You know, the reverse logistic required basically kills that main value proposition. So constantly when we, in Green Hope, we also try uh, other than bio-based, bioplastics, where we lo look for locally sourced material, we try recycle, but the homework number one is the economic viability. What is the economic through the value chain? If we don't understand that correctly, the, this unique behavior of plastic, it's all a matter of when we understand the economics, what is the price to fix this, right? Oftentimes it takes more money than what it's worth. Then the second question is, Who's going to subsidize it? So what is the so that becomes the homework of EPR? Every okay, what percentage coming from brand? What percentage from local community? What percentage from government? Indonesian, I mean, many of ASEAN government may not be have that budget. You see, if it takes one dollar, so to speak, to basically get this material, unload the garbage bag, flip it, put it into recycle, and it's only worth five cents. What's who's going to subsidize ninety five and and whether that's uh. <laughs> Right, that creates all sorts of weird stuff in plastic, such as the export of import, export and import of pla global plastic waste. Mm -hmm. Right, that reality is happening, and that it's because the economics of this wonderful material is weird. I can tell you, and that actually stum a lot of people in terms of the right solution and optimality. Yeah. <laughs> Good valid points, Tommy. Uh, Colin was nodding his head vigorously there. <laughs> I think I, I think I agree with you. And I think it does actually bring us uh, perhaps to a, another good part of the discussion. And Henriette mentioned it earlier, and that's the, the issue of free riding on, on EPR as well, where you know perhaps manufacturers unwillingly or unknowingly end up with their products in markets and they're not EPR fees aren't being paid. Um, is there a way of trying to tackle that sort of issue? And I'll, I'll come to you, Shin, first, please, on this question. Yeah, uh, uh, free writing actually is a long-standing issue. For example, Germany in 2015, the dual system almost crashed as the, the fee generated from the EPR system was much less than the, uh, the cost required to keep the system running. This was mainly caused by free writing. And Germany was one of the first country to introduce the EPR legislation for package in 1990. Since then, it has been amended several times over the years and it was replaced by the Package Act and the effect on January 1st, 2019. So one of the most significant change to EPR in Germany was from a single nonprofit PRO to a competing system in 2003, which means various for-profit PROs are in competition with each other. The competition uh, PRO system led to a reduction in collection and recycling cost. However, it made the system very complicated and also non-transparent. It became very difficult to uh, verify whether the obliged company had paid EPR fees to any PROs. So the quantity of package licensed under the system fell dramatically. 
So it was hard to maintain the EPR system at that time. The discussion around the politics and the industry and the other stakeholders have uh, conducted and the concluded that there is no competition without supervision. The new package act introduced a number of new requirements. And the main change was to set up a central agency package register as a controlling body for PROs and the abridged companies. The purpose is to increase the transparency and the monitor compliance with the principle of EPR. So apart from a contracting with PRO system, the abridged company are also required to register with the LUCID package re register before placing the packaged uh, products to the German market under the new act. The registration has to be done by the abridged company. And then there's a data reporting. Abridged company also need to report to the uh, contracted PRO, but also the, the, the central agency. Once the total weight exceeds a certain amount, the abridged company needs to submit the declaration of completeness, which also must be audited. There will be a penalty for up to uh, 100,000 euros if a bridged company fails to register or register incorrectly. The penalty will be up to 200,000 uh, euros if a bridged company fails to contract with the NEPROs. The central agency provides uh, clear guidance on which package uh, is subject to the system participation to avoid any misinterpretations, but also produce the guidance for audit and the guidance about the recyclability. And they, they are not only just check the data from obliged companies and the PROs, they also buy the market data and doing research and the analysis platform to compare on the data. In this way, they can identify any companies that are not uh, net on the free writers. So only one year later, the number of obliged companies almost doubled. So from the lesson of experience uh, the, the German yeah, had, we can see that the design and adjustment of the regulation should consider preventing free ride, riders from the very beginning. Otherwise, actually for Germany, it takes more than 15 years to make this happen, to, to have this kind of effective way to prevent the free riders. But of course, the improvement of the EPR system is a continuous effort. So for example, I think the, the, the rise of the e-commerce, particularly during, uh, due to the pandemic, the retail e-commerce uh, sales announced, uh, amounted to about 4.9 trillion US dollars worldwide. And uh, this figure is forecast to grow by 50% over the next four years. So, so reducing the free riders from the e-commerce were also a new challenge for EPR system. And the Germany uh, under the new uh, package act from uh, July 1st, the e-commerce platforms and then the fulfillment providers, they have the, uh, the, <clears throat> sorry, have the responsibility to ensure the registration and the licensing of eligible package has been performed and the responsible manufacturer. And the marketplace that is like Amazon mustn't enable offer of unlicensed package. So the unlicensed package cannot be sold in that marketplace. And also fulfill service must not carry out their service for unregistered manufacturers of unlicensed package. So I think for the free ride, I think the most important is you need to have very effective monitoring, controlling, and the management system to, to avoid that. And, but of course, I think um, there's also a lot of things uh, we need to do. And uh, it also depends on the country's yeah, situation. So the German example, I think it's just for, for the sharing and the reference. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Colin, I mean, you, uh, describe the system here in Singapore earlier, um, where you were um, getting importers of e-waste or e-electronic devices in this case to tell you how much they're importing, and then you were using that as the guide for the charges after collection of waste later. Do you think that's a system that should help to avoid the free riding? 
Yeah, so I think at, at the moment, um, a lot of these overseas sellers are not uh, bound by our legislation. And, and that's, um, you know, the nature of most domestic legislation, right? Mm. And, and we understand also that, um, you know, and most, most EPR schemes uh, also do not fully address this issue of uh, free ridership um, from overseas sellers as well as uh, online marketplaces. I mean, in Singapore, online marketplaces are not um, uh, obligated per se, uh, especially if the sellers are overseas. So uh, we, we have to look at how to, uh, you know, enhance the scheme to, 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 to close this loop of uh, free riding. And I think Sin talked about uh, something in Germany that they did that we will we, we study as well is to make online marketplaces actually legally uh, obligated under the scheme. Uh, yeah. Uh, right, we have about uh, 10 minutes to go. There are quite a few questions in the Q&A box. I will try and get through some of them. Uh, Colin, I'm afraid the first one is coming to you. Um, and and I, I know in Singapore at the moment, you're have EPR for e-waste. Um, the question really is about plans to extend to other forms of waste and how much help would you like from industry, particularly perhaps from glass recycling? Um, at the moment, um, I'm not sure if colleagues and friends out there have uh, uh, seen our Zero Waste Master Plan, which we actually launched and published in 2019. So we are, we are actually actively um, looking at um, the three key waste streams in Singapore, which is e-waste, food waste, as well as packaging waste, including plastics. Uh, so for food waste, there are some requirements uh, in 2024 for uh, you know, premises to uh, segregate their food waste. Uh, and, and therefore, there's, there's some responsibility in the sense of uh, the food waste generators. Uh, for packaging uh, waste, including plastics, um, we're looking at implementing an EPR scheme as well, uh, but probably later, sometime maybe 2025 or later. Uh, and as a start to that EPR scheme, um, we are actually... Uh, des designing and studying how to implement a beverage container return scheme first, which is essentially a deposit refund scheme is what it's called in um, places like EU and Australia, right? Mm. Uh, so um, we're hoping to, to roll the beverage container return scheme as the first phase of an EPR scheme. Uh, so to capture the, the, you know, the uh, plastic beverage containers, uh, aluminum drinks, drink cans and so forth uh, as, a, as a start to the EPR scheme, yeah. Thank you. Um, another question really, um, I think, comes to, to the crux of a problem for many people is that across large parts of Southeast Asia, there's a, there's a lack of the basic infrastructure on the ground to treat or, or, or manage waste for EPR schemes. Uh, what more can be done to, to put that in place? Does it have to be mandated by governments a lot more that the private sector can do or NGOs could be doing in this space? Um, perhaps I'll throw that one to, to Sunita first and maybe Tommy might want to chime in and then Colin can think about a government response for it. Um, I think, Chris, regardless if the EPR schemes are voluntary or mandatory, uh, companies such as Racket, you know, we have already taken on the challenge to reduce plastic in the environment. So we have a number of key headline targets, such as using 50% less virgin plastic, uh, using 25% PCR in our plastic packaging by 2025. Uh, but I also want to reiterate that we cannot do EPR without PCR. So we need the recycling network to develop so we can close the, uh, the loop. So that will help us, you know, to use a PCR for new packaging. But I believe we also need, uh, we should also lose track of the fact that plastic packaging for manufacturers of healthcare products, it helps to maintain product integrity for us and safety. And this is very critical for consumers. So while, while we are doing more on non-plastic uh, alternatives, uh, for example, at Racket, we have recently created a, a, created a polymer science uh, function, uh, which is uh, in, in our headquarters in the UK, where they are doing R&D on, uh, on uh, plastic alternatives. So, so we also need to understand that while we are doing all this work on non-plastic alternatives, at a practical level, plastic still provides some advantages in some cases. So we need to focus on its responsible use um, via the, the sorting and the treating and the collection and recycling and then uh, improving consumer behavior and uh, awareness programs uh, in, in ASEAN. Thank you. Tommy, anything you want to add? 
Yeah, uh, my, my frame, internal framework of thinking about this is that it always starts with the with the reduce, right? If the packaging is not necessarily, if the customers can use less of that, then uh, reduce. It needs to be advocated. And if they can still reuse, then reuse needs to be further advocated. And for a lot of the PT bottles and everything, then it's probably hard uh, to go to a different route uh, than it's recycled and it's economically viable to be recycled, right? It becomes fast fashion, the polyester yarn, um, therefore the infrastructure for that. And I think given the economics of it, to my knowledge, that's one of the nearest uh, to the economic viability in terms of the solutions. Yeah, some of the, I think to since points and Chen's point about the, the waste pickers and everything needs to be uh, further, get a bigger portion of the entire process or value creation of that too for their uh, own benefit and scalability uh, and sustainability for that their life too uh, but pt bottle but there, there's a lot of things like flexible films multi-layer packaging now these are the stuff that in asean context because of our economic level we can be more experimental we can think further in terms of what if we, uh, we use better behaving material bio-based material less carbon to start with but then let's may uh, let's go to the landfill over there and it will biodegrade and we capture the gas in the landfill too rather than try to recycle as a dogma but then we spend more money trying to collect try to try to process try to do everything as a total energy and effort and money cost is way more than let it go uh, because Indonesia has 17,000 islands. You understand the geography plays part in terms of the optimality, right? Last mile solution is always the most expensive. We know that in tech, we know that in, in plastic and everything too. So we, we need to be uh, open-minded. So I think part of this thing is really about how can we have more and more uh, collaboration and do a lot of trials in different geography and everything, and then analyze the economic viability, the in actual environmental impact, and uh, what is the total cost of the system, right? And have more and more and local trial and, and top-down trial as well as bottom-up trial. Uh, we should not approach this in a dogmatic fashion. Oh, uh, it's always be reduced, no plastic at all. Or, oh, it's always reused. Oh, it's always recycled. That's, that's often almost always not optimal uh, in terms of the reality on the ground. So we, we try on all those things, yeah. I think there's a lot. And then they will achieve the, the economic efficiency and the cl solution clearing price, if you will, that is present the best of, of environmental value and affordability and also good for the people too, and the planet, yeah. That, that's you. my belief, yeah. Thank you, Tommy. Henry, very quickly, before we wound up, um, Europe has very ambitious plans to double the amount of recycling that's going on. Um, how how are you going to do it? Yeah, good question. Well, first of all, we've been working on this for a long time, uh, and I apologize. You can see I've moved out now in the greenery uh, just to give some atmosphere to my uh, to my speech. Um, but um, I mean, you know, what we have been doing is we've been gradually increasing the targets over time. We we have very ambitious targets in Europe, uh, and and we have really uh, you know been building this up for a long time. And I think that would also be something that I would recommend. I mean, we don't have to start by uh, by uh, by the moon, uh, but we have to really start by doing something. And then also just a comment I wanted to add before, uh, I, I very much realized that um, that the situation is, of course, very, very different here uh, compared to Europe and, and that the whole uh, economy is very, very different. But I think what uh, we are speaking so much now about recovery after the pandemic and so on, and, and I think you know an aspect that is really needs to be said is that this is this is an actual crisis. I mean, it's not only climate change uh, and biodiversity that is a crisis, but I mean, if you look at the at the beaches, at the oceans, uh, the amount of plastic that is there, it's it's simply it's not a luxury. It's not something that we can. Uh, that we can do or not do. Uh, I mean, tourists are not going to come back. There's not going to be uh, anything to recover with unless we, we fix not only the future, but also really clean up from the past because it's uh, it's high time. So, uh, yeah, so. Quite agree. <laughs> high time, <laughs> yeah. high time was about 20 years ago to start the process. Okay, uh, the, the webinar had a question at the very beginning, which was um, legislating for EPR in ASEAN a need um, so I'm going to ask that question to all of you, a yes or no answer, and also, do you also see a need for an ASEAN-wide framework? So we'll start with Colin, because you're in my top left-hand corner. Is there a need to legislate? 
and do we need an ASEAN framework? Yeah, I think, I mean, legislation at the national level is it's definitely necessary. Uh, but at the regional level, I think we have to really study because um, all, the, all the countries have different levels of um, uh, you know, development and, and, and you know, their own national circumstances. So harmonizing some, uh, harmonizing you know, legislation across uh, countries, it's, it's uh, not going to be straightforward. But at least if, if um, uh, most countries have a regulated or legislated EPR system in place, then I think that's a good starting ground, yeah. Thank you. Sunita? I would say that um, whether, uh, if it, I mean, we are already seeing national legislations coming up. So that's the reality of the situation on the ground for manufacturers and companies such as Racket. So the key point is um, if ASEAN wants to create a harmonized framework, you know, there are some, some key principles and guidance that, you know, they need to provide to all the countries. So there's less compliance burden for, for companies such as Racket, who uh, we are very excited, we are very keen, and we are more than ready to take on the challenge, uh, you know, for our environmental future. Thank you. Uh, Shin, same question to you. A need to legislate, and should ASEAN look at doing something region wide? I think uh, most uh, the EPR is legislated at national level, but I think uh, at ASEAN level, I think uh, could be have kind of target, regional target and also could create a platform which can share and exchange the experience, you know, to build kind of connection with different countries and also practice a sharing. The other is the general guidance, like the principle, and also some, we, we actually got quite a lot of requests about the plastic credits. They always ask, how to in, integrate EPR, uh, the plastic into the, the EPR system, whether we, we should do that. So I think all these questions, as a level, could have some guidance and to help the national countries yeah, to have more clear understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And Tommy, your view. Uh, coming to the uh, building on Henry at this point, it is really we are in a crisis. So, uh, as much as I thought voluntary uh, could be good, but I don't think it will meet the time frame that we need. If that is necessary, it's important uh, for like learning. Is important in that is that there needs to be a, a consultation with the key or the well-meaning and the key stakeholders uh, very well to build to combine top-down uh, philosophy with the bottom-up reality to to arrive at the right uh, contextual EPR. And two, there's a approach of both sticks and carrots. Uh, yeah, uh, because Indonesia. At first, I reflect, we didn't used to wear our helmets when we ride a bike, right? And then also seat belts and everything. It was not part of our psyche. But right now it is. And it is really because there's a sticks uh, to it. It's pretty hard stick by the police, but then uh, the carrot also in it. So it's possible. It's possible to really change, but uh, in, a, in, a, in a good comprehensive fashion. And we need it because Indonesia as island nations as well, all our beaches inundated with plastics and everything, we, we can't afford another generation of things getting worse. Uh, yeah. Very true. Finally, Henry, uh, a different question for you. If ASEAN does want to start thinking about a, a regional wide guideline or framework um, where there's still national legislation underneath it, is the EU ready to help them? Yes, very much. We are okay. very ready. And I do think it's needed, but I think also exactly as, uh, as we just heard, other things are needed, voluntary approaches, European businesses uh, know a lot about how to do this. Uh, some of them are already here in the region and you know them very well, Chris. So uh, I hope that you will take them by the hand and bring them together with their ASEAN counterparts and, and they can be really great, uh, great uh, advocates for, for all of these voluntary approaches. And then also, I think all of us really needs to do something. So um, I, was a part of a beach cleaning uh, action recently uh, and I must say even after having worked on this for 20 years I was really shocked with what you find when you do this so I think all of us needs to really have a serious look at this at this so um, next time we'll try to organize something as they and white uh, and uh, we'll do it together. Excellent thank you I'll certainly be pushing our members more and more on this though many of them are actually leading the charge already. Uh, thank you to all of you for your time uh, this afternoon or this morning uh, and for joining us here, a stimulating debate. I think we could have carried on for a lot longer. Apologies to the people in the audience whose questions 
I didn't get to, but we are out of time. So the key message really is uh, reduce, reuse, recycle, and accelerate the process, I think, for all of this going through for all of us. Um, I wish you all to keep safe and well. Um, everyone, um, please keep on looking after the environment for all of us and for the future of all of our children as well. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.